one, two. I think it's already saying that we setting it up for live. Okay. I'm also, while I'm sitting here chastising you about your phone, I need to get my entire life together because why do I need to get my entire life together? I'm gonna tag you in the post too, because people really-, really It's just it. crazy because, you know, I had an Android like for years. Um, I remember you couldn't tell me nothing when I had, you know, the pink razor. You remember the Motorola razor? You couldn't right. tell me nothing. Now I got this Samsung S9 phone and everybody got iPhone. You had an so. S9? Yeah. I don't, I don't even know what that means, Simone. That's why I need a new phone. <laughs> what is an S9? Can the internet tell us what is an Galaxy, S9? I think it's called Galaxy S9. It's like the lower, lower version of Galaxy. That's what it says. It says um, when I pay my bill, it says Samsung Galaxy S9, meaning Samsung Galaxy 9. Or I don't know what the hell, but that's what comes up. Well, thank you for letting me know about your struggle in life. I appreciate it. <laughs> we both curly haired today. You see us out here, sis? Mm. But all I like do is the burning food and everything. Listen, I burn. So, okay. So, first of all, let me welcome you because I am overjoyed I get to speak with you. Um, and I'm going to tell people why I'm overjoyed in a second. So, I also want to be um, mindful because I'm moderating Facebook comments and I'm making sure the live is. So if y'all could let me know if you can hear me and Simone clearly. Simone, do a mic check, one, two, one, two. Okay. Say something constructive, Simone. Your hair is bomb. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all heard that? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, hi, Shamika. So I want to welcome y'all to episode four of The Full Set. I'm here with my very special guest, Simone Gordon. Simone, welcome to the full set. How you doing, boo? I'm fine. Thank you for Are you fine? Me. That doesn't look like an I'm fine face. <laughs> Guess the vibe today. That's the best we're going to get today? All I'm right, fine Nikki. today, y'all. I'm fine. Okay. Nikki said uh, she could hear you loud and clear. So I'm going to okay. tell y'all niggas why we late. So the first reason why we was late is because I still work full time. And even though I told them I'm off today at three, it doesn't really mean it because I'm in charge of a newsletter. We writing about this pandemic. We informing people. It's wild. So, and then I got to live my life outside of my work hours, right? And I got to do this work-life balance, but I find myself doing more work, right? <laughs> so, um, but I'm really excited that you're here because when, once I get down to it, I'm excited that you're here, right? Um, Brittany Chanel Johnson says hi, and we say hi, baby. Hi, Tony. Hey. So, okay, so I wanted to welcome you to this episode. I'm just gonna hop right into all the things. Simone, when did we first meet? We met back in 2016 when 2016. I, don't don't talk about my age now. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it was in 2016. You had a big post. And you were asking a lot of white people to give up reparations um, and don't ask questions. Um, some people uh, did not follow the instructions. I think I was one of them. You're like, why are you telling your situation? I said, hey, um, I need diapers. My son is autistic. Can somebody help? And I remember one of the donors had gave me $50. I was able to get his melatonin and his depends. And I inboxed you. You're like, bitch, why are you thanking me? It's old to you. So that's when I met you. I was mean to you? No, you just said, bitch, why are you thanking me? It's old to you. And that was it. <laughs> I still got that message. It wasn't That's mean. Oh, wow. Now, now I got to go back in the messages and be like, remove, remove. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now I think about how I'm in community with you, right? And people are like, oh, you know, a lot of people know you. And it's, yeah. it's interesting because I feel like people know you because you're in your own lane, right? You do your own thing. We got a lot of mutuals and you do your own thing. So I wanted to reach out to you. Megan Casey's so ignorant. Hi. I know that's exactly how she said it too. Um, how did you decide that this, this work that we do, like, first of all, what is reparations to you? What does that look like? 
reparations to me is something that's owed to black people. Um, I feel as though um, we can do what we want with it. But what I do uh, personally is I try my best to help us get stabilized, help us get businesses, help us get to school, help us with our mental illness. So that's what my platform is basically about. Um, reparations have helped me um, very much so get back into school because it took me 10 years. I was working a job and kept losing the job and kept being homeless. And mm -hmm. then Jarvis, he had his diagnosis. And so, Jarvis is your son. How old is Jarvis now? 12? He will be 10 in September 2nd. Why I think that black children are so older than they really are. I don't know. Like, do I don't know. That baby going to be 10. He's 10. He's five foot three and wear a size 10 and a half shoe. Wow. Right. God bless you, mama. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Egypt's already, um, I feel like Egypt's little Kim's height. Like, you know what I'm saying? Egypt's three should be four in November. And I feel like little Kim and Egypt are probably about the same height. Like everyone thinks that Egypt's five. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, no, that's my baby. That's why I'm constantly <laughs> thinking like three, you know? Um, so now you said that you were looking to um, do reparations as a form of like helping black femmes and black women stabilize themselves. Remind me to connect with you. I'm just throwing out there. I just got an inbox while I was trying to set up the live um, that a black sex worker in New Jersey, and I know you out there in Jersey, um, this woman is in Atlantic City. Her rent is due by Friday. The landlord's been playing games. And you know, this COVID shit has us like, everybody is in an upset. And so if she doesn't pay her back rent by Friday, like she's done, she's out, she ain't got no place to live. So I wanted to connect just Davis with you so that way y'all can try to set something up. And if you need me to amplify, of course, I hope, like, you know, um, but I just feel like that's more your your area, you know, so I'm not gonna be overstepping, but you know, so. I got you. Um, Nikki said she has a lot of resources. Well, she said, you know, and no nigga, I didn't know, I'm sorry, Nikki, that she has a lot of resources surrounding autism. So if you need someone, um, Nikki's a dope person. I'm gonna have her on the show too. So um, her name is Nikki G. So reach out to her. No problem. I'm also an advocate in New Jersey as well. Um, I'm actually on ground. Um, I don't know if anybody saw, but I won my case against the state of New Jersey. They were trying to put the state of New Jersey. Yeah, they Come were on, trying tell us about it. They were well. It was all over. Matter of fact, well, at the time, I don't think you saw it, but um. I'll tag you in it. What happened was for the past three years, they wanted my son who's severely autistic nonverbal to be in a regular setting class. Mm -hmm. um, and then they pushed him into special ed and they did not have the aid for him. And he's not toilet trained, he still has issues. So I was fighting for him to be in a special needs school where he's able to um, get special services and get his needs met. So for three years I was fighting it because mostly um, it takes you know, for some time for you to have a lawyer, have money. I said, mm -hmm. listen, I don't have money, so I'm going to fight it. I wrote letters. I wrote to the damn governor at the time. Nobody did anything. So I went to Rutgers Law Clinic and I got some law students. Rutgers to help University? Me. Yeah. Okay. And I went ahead and I went to the courts. They had their law student there. And for like a whole month, I was back and forth. I put my whole journey on Facebook. And it was May 2019, I won against the state, and he's in a special needs school right now. So each and every year, you know, you still have that IEP, and that's why I tell Black families with um, children who have developmental disabilities, it's very important to read that IEP because you never know what you're signing off on. So um, since that happened, I've been advocating with other families, and they've been winning cases as well. So I just don't do fundraising. I also advocate for so you're doing local community work for those who are impacted, including your son. Now, what's an IEP for folks who don't know? An IEP is an individual evaluation plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. plan. I say evaluation plan. And it basically lists the goals, your children's strengths, and what's needed. Um, in the state, they tell the parents that they have to go to these meetings. Half of the parents were not going to the meetings. Half of the parents wasn't even having the IEP updated. And that's mm -hmm. extremely important. Um, I wasn't one of those parents. It's just that they were fighting me saying, I'm not paying for your child 
um, to go to a different school for 60,000. Um, number one, he's black. Number two, he's autistic. Number three, they were asking questions on, you know, did you drink during your pregnancy? Did you smoke weed? So these are the things. Right, they're they putting the responsibility on you as if like autism had a, had a reason. Correct, and they do that to a lot of black mothers. Some give up, but I didn't, I fought it. And after I fought it, I was able to advocate and get a lot of parents who are on my page for their children to get, you know, the um, services that they needed. Thank you for sharing that with us because I feel like even for myself, that's a that's a that's a serious reminder. Like, um, I just got a letter. Let me let me cover it up. I just got a letter from my child's um, special education instruction teacher, and Egypt has developmental disabilities. Egypt has an issue with executive function. They want Egypt to go to a center-based school. Um, and for me, I pushed back. I was like, no, we are normal over here. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't speak until I was four years old. And now y'all can't get me to shut up. Like, you know, so in my mind, I was like, this is what it is. Like, you're not gonna tell me my child is very smart at two years old. I would unplug the TV and Egypt would walk right back over and go like this and then figure it out that I unplugged the TV. Like, you understand what I'm saying? My child has always been advanced, but I didn't know that just because they were, I know the term is not high functioning anymore, but because they were high functioning in their developmental dis disorder, um, I was just like, no, it's just, it's just a delay, you know, and that's what developmental right. disability is. It can be a delay, you know, and I was, right. I was so ignorant, Simone. I really was. I was, as far as me being on a platform, I was like, no, not my child. I don't want my child to go to this school. I don't want, and now my nigga. You can't get me to shut up. I'd be contacting the Office of Children and Family Services on my kids' school. I'd be like, and what? Like, no, my my child is safe at the fire escape one time. The fire escape is on the first floor where the classroom is, you know. And um, they had the nerd to send me a letter talking about Egypt is a disruption. And I'm like, absolutely two, not. Two, like that's a supervision issue because at the end of the day, if Egypt was at my house, and escape through my window and somebody found her outside, that's a problem. That would be ACS, uh, DCYF, whatever the, the program is, contacting me and being like, you got a case open against you for child neglect. So like, I, I do agree with you. I think a lot of us need to read the IEPs. We do need to advocate for our children because there's a stigma around mental health issues and also developmental disabilities. Like we don't want to get our children the help we need because then that would mean that they can't, they can't, we cannot give them the help that they need, you know? And a lot of um, a lot of politicians, especially, and also in the education system, and I know that you had a taste of it, they think that black and brown families do not give a damn. They think that a lot of us, which we don't, just get a check for our child and keep it moving. Um, they think that, you know, um, we have so many other things that we're more in tune versus being in tune with our children. So right. I had to let that be known in the courtroom. It was a beautiful thing when I won that um, uh, case. Um, it was all over, like families all over from New York and New Jersey, like, hey, what can I do? A lot of people don't know. Yes, you could get your child diagnosed at a pediatrician, but it's best to go to a state hospital, a children's specialized hospital, to get that piece of paper so that when you go in front of the judge, go, I took my child to a state hospital, not just a pediatrician. Right. So it's a lot of things as parents. And that's why I said it's very important. And I'm happy that you're having these type of interviews and these types of discussions, uh, Didi, because we could all learn from each other, from parenting to coping with um, mental health, right? Um, ha housing insecurity, food insecurity, whatever a person platform is. But we could all learn from each other and just come together. So, you know, um, yeah, I do a lot of fundraising. I am good at it, but I also advocate in my community on the stomping grounds of Northeast Orange and make sure some of the families get what they need. Come on, Northeast Orange, New Jersey. <laughs> like, you know, I only went to Jersey one time and I will never go back again. Now, if you recall, it was the rich area, Dee. No, it wasn't the rich area. Nigga, I was in Newark. Like, are you kidding? 
Oh, what part? Because there's different parts in North Honey. I could take you around. I went with a friend of mine. She's probably going to hate that I'm telling this story. I went with a friend of mine. I think I told this story on the internet, so she hates me already. It's fine. I went with a friend of mine. She was talking to this dude that she had met off Instagram or whatever, but I had been talking to him for like a year. We went to go meet him, and it turns out he's like a producer. He got a nice spot. And then, of course, I'm the fat friend, so I get sick with his cousin. And the cousin, he wasn't bad looking, but... His breath stinks. I don't know. I didn't get that close, Monica. I just, he wasn't for me. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm a talker. Don't get me wrong. I'm very pro-ho. I'm very sex positive. But I'm a talker. I'm like, let's talk about it before we have sex. And he wasn't interested in talking. He wanted to take me into the bathroom. I was like, oh, I'm not here for that. I'm here because I drove. And she's here to see her little friend or whatever. And we was with another woman. And then, like, he was like, well, if you ain't fucking to leave, bitch. And I was like... Gotta go. <laughs> you know I was like, I've been kicked out of better establishments. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible story. But that's why I won't come back to Jersey. But the reason why I'm so excited to speak with you is because if you recall, I think it was April 14th, I inboxed you and I was like, I'm coming to scoop you. And you was like, You coming to do what? I said, We're gonna have brunch. And you was like, I can't. Because I don't have nobody to watch Jarvis. I said, we're going to bring him with us. And you got mad at me. You was like, no, we can't bring him with us. Jarvis would tear shit up. If we go to a restaurant? Yeah. But he has gotten better. If it's the right restaurant and it's not a lot of noise, he will sit and eat. Um, A lot of people don't understand. They just hear autism and they see like a kid just jumping all over the place. My son needs 24 hour care. He's on a severe end of the spectrum. Like he could be sitting and he'll make a noise and people are like, oh my God, that noise is destructive. But that's Mm -hmm. my life. That's what I do. I wake up 4 a.m. and I take care of him, clean him up, change him. You know, um, there's a high function and low function. More people people are around children who are on the higher uh, spectrum. But a lot of people are like, wow, I didn't know that autism is like this. And I'm like, yeah. Right. You know. Can I tell um, you something? Remember when we said we wasn't going to judge each other? I keep looking at this empty spot, this wall right here in my kitchen. And I'm feeling self-conscious about it. And now I buy myself a piece of art. Because what else can I do? I, something has to go there. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> No, seriously. I don't know. I might have Egypt draw on the wall. That will work. Thank you. I appreciate it. So you basically have to care for Jarvis, um, who's 10 or about to be 10, on like a full-time basis. Like, what does that look like for you as a Black woman, as a mother, as a single mother? Like, what is that like? You know, like, I get overwhelmed a lot. Um, sometimes when people come at me in my inbox, instead of talking, they need help, they need fundraising. Yeah, I don't understand. Like, I'm in college. Um, I in college. Chose, yeah, I chose to go back to college um, so that I could have a better life and to also help people heal. Um, and, and what are you going to school for? Me. I am going to school for nursing, and I want to deal with the mental health aspect of um, you know, just being around children with developmental disabilities and adults more so and help the families. Um, I did begin social work years ago in 2007, but I'm like, no, I want to be um, hand over hand healing them, understanding them, making right. society understand them as well. So my day to day is I wake up 345, 4 a.m. Um, I change this diaper, I change the linen every day. That's why some of y'all niggas see me. Um, buying Tide all the time, independent. Right. Um, get him ready for school. Um, eight o'clock, um, we're out the door for him to go to school. Sometimes my hair is not done. Right. Drop him off at school, rush on a bus, on, you know, on a city bus to get. Um, for oh, you his. take the city bus? I don't have a car. I can't afford it. Come on. Yes. Come on. Black Prairie Guy Malenga. So I get my, ass, get my ass on a city bus or Uber. Um, and go to school. School starts at 8.35 for me, and I get out of school at 2.25. 
and my mom and dad sometimes they um try to get him from school for me because they know by the time I get out of school I can't get him um and then he's home when I get home gotta make sure he you know get all his clothes out of his um his bag because sometimes he has accidents see if he has any um homework cook dinner put the dirty clothes in the washing wash it get myself ready for work get home at 12 right and then when i come home at 12 i gotta iron his uniform and do my homework then get in the bed by the time in the bed is like one to two o'clock and then in the morning um, yeah that's my day every day Shit. So, and on top of all of that you do as a mother, as a mother of a severely autistic child, you telling me that Black women everywhere are calling you the Black fairy godmother because you're making their dreams come true? Incredulous. So you decided, you know what, I know what it feels like to experience not having no diapers. You know what it feels like to be like, I need medicine for my son. And you started seeing the need on Facebook and you decided that you were going to start helping fundraise for these women? Yeah, yeah. I, started, I started years ago. And um, I started after I got kicked out of reparations and offering after me and um, Natasha got into it because I didn't like Facebook the group. She, what a Facebook group. I didn't like the way she was treating other Black, black families who were trying to um, make ends meet and try to feed their families. So um, I was helping them on my Facebook page, get money and taking some of the donors and putting them on my Facebook page to make sure these families got. So she kicked me out the group. And after she kicked me out the group, I decided that I was going to start something. And, you know, um, I, I started to just focus on special need black moms. And then I'm like, I can't just discriminate because there's other black single mothers who need help. And, you know, um, it didn't go so so well but why didn't it go so so well because i partnered with someone and we had our differences um but you know despite the differences a lot of positive things came out um between us both we um helped a lot of families um we stabilized a lot of people um there is five women that's in louisiana that i've been mentoring and these women did not have anything um, and one of them is special needs and she, um, you know, had five children and she wow. was prostituting and that's all she knew. Mm -hmm. So at the time she has a GED, we moved her out the trailer. Um, she's doing well and she's going to school to be a medical assistant and the other women are stable. They got their GEDs, they working. And um, one more other female, she's going to start her cleaning business. She said, listen, Ms. Gordon, I'll do my GED. She called you Ms. Gordon. <laughs> they called me Ms. Gordon. Uh, I ain't going to no college. I ain't going to no trade school, but help me get some money so I can start my cleaning business. And wow. her cleaning okay. business is doing very well. Okay. So, so do you feel like Black women sometimes, especially because racism is so pervasive, that Black women sometimes just need like a small helping hand? Because Black women are really holding up everybody. Everybody. That's all we need. That's all we need. They thought that nobody, like there was nobody on this planet to help them. And, and they like the white people that like, say, go ahead, baby. They're like, well, damn, she poor too. She got it bad too. I'm like, we all got it bad, but if we could help one another and just, you know what I'm saying, just lift one another, hey, let's make this shit happen. And that's what happened. And they successful. No. Now, what about the white people who don't donate to you and constantly have something to say about the work that you do? I get that every day. I get a lot of hate mail. I thought Instagram. it was just me. I I got four emails yesterday after my um, interview with Tobias, and they were like, you cockamamie, black, uppity, nigger bitch. I'm like, welcome back, guys. <laughs> I wasn't getting it on Facebook, but I'm getting it more so on Instagram. I'm getting threats. I'm getting, I'm a racist fat bitch. Um, that's why my son is retarded. I get all that shit in my Instagram. And one lady was like, well, I donated $50 a couple months ago. Can I have your TIN number? Because I want to write off my taxes. No, I don't have that. Sorry. And you right. will never get that, even if I did have that. So I, so I get a lot of that. One lady 
ask me, well, you're fundraising all this money. Have you ever thought of fundraising to get your hair done? I said, no, bitch, but you can. Um, she asked you to get your hair home. done? I can screenshot and it. these are also the same subset of people who will be like, they're abusing the money. They're getting their nails and their hair done. I just, I couldn't believe that when you told me that, that some girl told you you had the same lace front, how you raised all this money. So that goes into my next question. What is it about what we do? So if you're fundraising and I'm fundraising and we're saying this money is going to this black family, this black them, this black queer person, we're doing this. Why do people assume that because we're getting a higher platform, we're gonna talk about how your platform just blew up just now, right? Why is it when people get a, make the assumption that, oh, because you got a lot of donors and you got a lot of people giving you money for other people that you yourself are somehow living large and in charge? What's your living situation like right now? My living situation, there's seven people in a one family home um, that we're renting and me and Jarvis share the same room. My son has to sleep with me because he's a choker and sometimes he chokes on his saliva. So all of his stuff and my stuff is in one room and we share one bed. So I don't know where all that money's going. That's why I had to start posting receipts because I got tired of being harassed because the, the thing about me, a lot of people who know me know I'm friendly and I love on black people, period. If you right. say something, I need $4 or $5 or damn smoke. Can I have uh $20? I'm gonna get a pack of beer and some cigarettes. I'm like, I'm gonna make sure you get that $20. That's right. the type of person I am. And I made too many friends and during that time, I, I I didn't know that I was involved with a lot of individuals who were not as genuine as I was. So it forced me to start showing receipts after I fundraised to say, hey, you will never see me with a, a um, expensive car, expensive lay front. Here's the actual damn money. Here's the person saying, thank you, Simone. I got the money at 8.45 p.m. So I had to do that because, you know, I, you know, I made a lot of friends and I dealt with a lot of people who were not genuine, who were not sincere in the work that we do. So I had to do that. It wasn't no Kuna situation. It wasn't none of that because every person that you see our fundraise for is either black or brown. Right. Hell, I, you know, I even fundraised for a black uh, dog who, who was a medical dog that somebody need. But the point Black of that is, matter, nigga. <laughs> listen, this lady said, listen, I need, I'm blind, my dog, you know, mm. I need this dog, and I did it. But the point of the matter is, I make sure that the money goes straight to the um people. So people go, yeah, but you got 13 points so-and-so. Okay, but I'm still a broke bitch. Right, I'm still right. struggling, and I'm still having my own health issues and my own issues dealing with my son. You know, so now when you say you have your own health issues, that resonates with me because a lot of not a lot of people know that I'm disabled. And I don't even like to talk about my disability because then it makes me feel like I have to come to reckonings with things I can't do and like places I can't be. I can't stand next to a microwave. I can't have my cell phone on the left side of my body. You know, my friend calls me the bionic woman because I have a pacemaker. And, and this girl named Laura Williams, or one of some of the youngest people that I know have pacemakers. I've had mine since I was 16. She's had hers since she was four, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I think about just like what comes with that, like, you know, like me being overweight because it's really difficult to like maintain a weight when you really can't exercise. Like, you know, and then, you know, the common section is like, oh, you fucking fat whore. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, just a whore, please. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> Please, please. How do you deal with um, being a large woman and having to navigate caring for your child while also like needing to like support and care and love on yourself? I, I feel don't. like you're not doing it. Yeah, I looked at your eyebrows. I see that. I don't. I don't. I don't at all. There's been plenty of times when you know, you and a few other Black women, some Black women who I never even had personal conversations with, who just came in my inbox like, you know, I post on Facebook sometimes, listen, I'm not okay. Stop inboxing me, y'all. I'm not okay. Right. I literally don't be okay because I be tired. 
Right. I, you know, I want to get my nails done and my hair done. I want to get a massage. I want a black chocolate or brown man to rub all over me and do, you know, everything that you see on black porn. Back hub, it up, but, flip it, rub it down. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, I can't, you know. Right. But eventually I'll get there. I just got to keep going. But, you know, that's just to let people know, yes, I, the money I raise and all of that, I don't get, so I snapped that at the um, white woman. She's like, yeah, and then I see on a baby registry, you put a dresser drawer up there, that's $300. How come the mother can't have a plastic drawer? I said, do Billy and Mike have a plastic fucking dresser? Mm, Come on, it's about dignity, yes. It's about dignity. Just because we're poor, we gotta, we have to have the bottom of the, we have to, if the opportunity presents itself, these white people literally the opportunity presents themselves all the time to step on our backs in order to get ahead and when i say step on our backs i mean like silence like to acknowledge that racism doesn't happen to me is silence and violence you know and so like so if someone do a fundraiser for me if someone do a fundraiser for you uh, i remember you know like not a lot of people know this i think i was going through something severe i think i was having like um it, I don't really talk about it and we don't have to get into me, but I was going through a very tough time. Like I was hospitalized and my sister was pregnant at the same time. So I just got out the hospital. I really wasn't fucking with the internet. Like I was just sitting in my house watching The Wire, like, you know, um, before Ashley Yates and I like kind of stopped talking to each other. I remember like snitching on myself. That's what, that's what Tobias said yesterday. You snitch on yourself all the time. I was like, you know what's funny? I said, I've sat in this house and I'm scared to tell people that all I've done is eat in my bed and watch The Wire. Like, you know what I'm saying? But you did something for me while I was going through that. Nobody knew. I didn't tell nobody publicly what I was going through. And um, I think I was going through postpartum depression, really. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I had just had Egypt. And my sister was pregnant and she was asking me, you know, "Can can you post my link? And I was like, I can't. I don't want. It's not that I don't want to. I'm just. I'm tired. I don't want to fundraise no more. I'm, you know. And you stepped up. You was like, give me your sister's address. We're gonna send her everything. And by the grace of God, whoever your ancestors are, I know that they're shining on you. Thank you. Because you sent my sister a crib, a stroller, diapers, formula, clothes. Like these white women. I don't know what you you sprinkle it. Do you sprinkle a little crack on them? I don't know. Like they literally, I don't know what kind of black fairy godmother you are, but <laughs> they sniff it and they and you know and the fact that they go for it. You know, I just love what I do. Like there was a woman in Boston who's I think she's on our platform and she inboxed me like because of this corona situation, her daughter is eight months pregnant and her daughter can't get nothing. Right. Um, we were able to, I did the baby's registry and she's like, damn, I, you know, I wasn't even thinking about a hundred dollar thermometer. Damn. I wasn't thinking about a crib. I wasn't thinking about a baby rocker. She like, damn. Um, it's like UPS guy was like, did you hit the lottery? Right. You know, but I just love doing that for us. Cause don't nobody do it for us. And, and we deserve hell- it. it. Right. We deserve it because at the end of the day, she got have her hundred dollar thermometer. It's not gonna change her living situation. It's just gonna help her improve the level of care she gives to that baby. Like you know what I'm saying? Like it's not the end of the world, you know. So right. I wanted to talk to you about how your platform blew up because you've been doing this for at least four and a half, five years that I've been watching you. And I remember, like, I think it was like a year and a half ago. I think your Instagram blew up and it was like, whoever the lady, the eat, pray, love, namaste shit. Oh, shit. Elizabeth Gilbert, what's her name? She decided, did she like reblog you or something like that? Let me, well, she ain't reborn me. That's not an, I don't think that she reborn me. I just think that it was luck. Um, A lot of people don't know, but Elizabeth Gilbert loved black women. She loved what we do. Um, she's been for us for a while. Um, she's in New York with a lot of nonprofits that are for women of color, and she donates a lot to them. Um, she just didn't want to put it out there so that everybody would attack her and and would want to um, actually just um, you know beg. Um, right. 
begging is not the correct uh, verb, I mean, verbiage, but so Jen Pasloff is a writer. Okay. And one and one day I was having a financial hardship despite me fundraising for other families. Right. Um, I needed food and depends for my son. So I said, I'm making Target and Amazon wish list for people. Let me make a Target wish list for my Yourself. I mean, because let me pause you for a second. A lot of people would be like, oh, you should be selfless in this work. Ah, 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 ah. But at the end of the day, if, you know, Tamla is the one who always told me, she told me yesterday too, because I was like, I can't do it. I can't. She's like, bitch, you got to put gas in your tank. Like, you can't be pretending that like, oh, I got this car that I need to move from Brooklyn all the way to LA. I got to get it there. I got to get it there. But I ain't got no gas. What you going to do? Just be like, I ain't got no gas. You got to stop. You, I don't have the time to get gas. You got to stop and get gas. You have to refuel yourself. So if you make an Amazon wish list for yourself, I raised money, $1,700 for my class in order for me to get my degree audit. The degree audit was the most important thing. I've not been in school in four and a half years, my nigga. Like, you understand what I'm saying to you? Same here. It was over like what eight years I haven't been in school. Right. So you know, people were judgmental. They're like, oh, she fundraised for everybody. They call her the black fairy, blah, 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 blah. Why the hell the she's black asking? fairy godmother? Get it right. <laughs> Let me explain something. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna put my pride aside if my son needs to eat, if he needs depends, if he needs medication. I'm going to do what I need to do. And not only do I take care of my son, I have other family members I take care of too. I just don't tell people that. And both of my parents are disabled as well. So I went ahead, I made a target list. I asked Jennifer who had a big platform because she's a writer. Can you share my target list? Because I'm in desperation. People are judging me because they're like, oh, well you fundraise for all these different people. So now you want to beg too. It's not about begging. Before I start becoming a big black organizer, bitch, I didn't have formula. I didn't have diapers. I didn't have medication. So you know, I went ahead, I put my pride to side as a mother, as a woman. I asked this white woman to share it within an hour. She got it done. So after that, um, she came to me and said, you want to know who bought your whole target list? And I'm like, who? I said, well, who, Denzel? Because I see, him. you know, he follow her ass too. So I didn't, I didn't <laughs> She said a woman named Elizabeth Gilbert who admired that you're in school, you're fundraising for other women. Mm-hmm. Um, she went ahead and she bought Jarvis his medication and his diapers. And Elizabeth is giving you a heads up that you should um, do an Instagram. I said, I'm not computer savvy. So right. during the time of going through a transition of, you know, thinking a lot of people is genuine and they're on my side. Um, I went ahead and I asked somebody to create me an Instagram because I'm not computer savvy. So, you no, know, I appreciate when, you saying that there's a lot of people that where we come from are not like, you know, because I didn't have a laptop. Elizabeth got me a laptop. I was going to the school library to do Eat my homework. Pray love bitch got you a laptop. She did give me a laptop because oh, I didn't have God, one. I know because like, how am I supposed to do my homework and maintain right. my GPA is a 3.7 if it wasn't for her. Come on. And so she got the laptop and everything and it's not Apple bitches. No, it's not. It came from Target HP. <laughs> so, um, so she went ahead and she said, you need to do an Instagram and you need to tell people what, like how important it is for black women to get reparations and to love on black women, period. Right. And I went ahead and I did an Instagram. I had about 180 followers. And then all of a sudden, um, I'm asleep and my phone is start ringing. They like, oh, this uh, this bitch had went ahead. Excuse me, Elizabeth. Sorry for calling you a bitch. But yeah, this bitch went ahead and put a post and got all these people um, that's on your platform that want to help people. And I'm like, what? So my it raised from 100 all the way to 3,000. You went from having a hundred followers on Instagram for someone who did not even know the internet to having 3,000 followers? 3,000 followers. And I start fundraising on my Instagram and I was able to like do three fundraisers a day and help people get stable, help people stop their evictions. I was posting people target lists, Amazon lists, right. um, just a whole bunch of situations. And um, I was just posting. Then all of a sudden, 
Um, a lot of people were tagging their friends, follow this girl if you want to help monthly, if you want to do this. Now, mind you, my Patreon account is not popping, but people are are getting fed. Like my people, people who look like us is getting fed. Mm-hmm. So that's all that mattered to me. So then all of a sudden- no, I love um, you so much. People that look like us is getting fed. Come on now. So then all of a sudden I went ahead and I did a flyer because every year I do something that's called wishlist angels around Christmas. And what I do is I let black kids pick whatever the fuck they want, put it on a Why? target. Why? Uh, toys for tots will not let them pick whatever the fuck they want. Right. So I had a big live, my first live ever on Instagram to explain to um, white people what my wishlist angel is. It's either you buy it or you don't. Right. You have to take a wish list. Share it on your Facebook, Instagram platform, or take that bitch to work and have and ask 10 friends to buy one or two items. When I say a whole bunch of black kids were having um, those little Jeeps that they ride around when they're two or three years old, PlayStations, Nintendos, TV. I don't know if you saw um, some kids didn't even have beds. They were getting beds. Um, we help a woman get um, a love seat. Um, one woman got married and she was leaving New York. So she had a apartment full of furniture and she was mm-hmm. able to have one of the young ladies that me and you know who don't have much and got two kids. She donated all her furniture to that girl wow. and helped pay her rent for two months. Wow. So I was loving it. And then after that, um, Parade Magazine um, reached out. And they did a little article on me and, you know, and spoke about, you know, reparations. That was okay. A little something. Then I grew to uh, 4,500 around January 1st. The bitch got more followers than I do. I'm here, I'm here to learn. I mean, I'm learning from you, okay? And then it was 4,500. And then all these editors and people, so, like some of these people were taking wish lists and I didn't even know that they were important people. I didn't know some of them were celebrities. I didn't know some of them um, were Broadway stars and they are all white. And they're like, well, you guys taught me the importance. Like, I didn't know people in the South was that poor. I said, you know, but you just don't want to know. So let me tell you one something. So after that, um, the woman from People Magazine, she's been following me for quite some time. She was one of the hundred followers who started following me was buying formula and diapers. Right. Um, every time I put a post to somebody needs it, she was sent $300 worth of formula, diapers, whatever the case may be. Right. Come to find out, as um, soon as the pandemic happened, she's like, I want to write um, about what's going on, how a lot of Black people are dying from the pandemic, but I do see- And this was before like, Van Jones started talking about Black people dying, so go ahead. Yeah, so-, um, so a lot of organizers were like, well, what the hell is going on? Like, how did you get People Magazine? I screenshot them the whole conversation I had from October to now to show them. I did not go to this woman. I right. never knew this woman was an editor. All I knew is there was a white woman in Manhattan who anytime I post that, you know, a black woman is in need of formula, diapers, wipes, whatever, weed, whatever, she's always to the rescue of putting in $300 worth through Amazon, Target, or Walmart. But that was your ancestors. It wasn't, it wasn't, that's a connection that needed to happen. And it happened organically. You wasn't like, oh, give us money because we're the best out here doing it or whatever. You was just like, this is what I do. Like, come or don't. And I love that you have always said that. Either buy the kids the gifts or don't. Nobody's asking, like, nobody begging you over here. And I think that's a common misconception in the work that we, you and I do, is that people assume that we're out here begging for coins or whatever. And I, I, I beg to differ. Because I feel like you, you're you right. We have put a lot of people in situations where they're more stable than what they started out with. You know? Right. Right. So this that's People how Magazine, you was in People Magazine? I, I was in People Magazine. She wrote about I need one of those things that go, yay. Thank you so much. So like during the pandemic, like I did a live, I don't know if you was on it, but some people were, I just went the hell off about how black people are fucking dying. And I was the first one, no disrespect to Van Jones or anybody, but I was like, my peoples are living in Brooklyn. They're in Brownsville. And they said people are dying in their apartments and someone were dying in the Bronx. They have portable hospitals that are in Manhattan in the parks. Right. What about 
people live in the Bronx and Brooklyn. So these are different black people who are coming on the live talking about it. And she's like, you spoke about so many things and I've been inspired all these months. I want to write an article and people to tell how much money you raised. I raised 87,000. I, when people came to me and said they needed money for food, they needed money for whatever, we cashed at them, we PayPal them, we Venmo them, um, we sent out Instacarts. You know, I didn't ask no questions. If somebody said they needed that money for something, we just sent it and kept it moving. Right. You know, I kept the receipts or whatever, but yeah, we raised 87000 Um, I sent it out. Congratulations, boo. I just posted that article in the comments. So if people who are watching, and I also when I upload it to the podcast, you people will be able to click on the article and read more about you. I pinned it so people can view as they as they listen. Yeah, and it wasn't about seven thousand dollars, boom. Yeah, we yeah we did the calculation. It was eighty seven. So what I did was the first fifty seven thousand we gave out on our own, and then after that I said. I'm not going to be fucking greedy and I'm not going to sit here and just be like, you know, that I'm that bitch. There's other organizers out here. There's other activists out here. Not only do they need money, but there's people on their platform need money too. So I just spread the love all around. Like, here, bitch, take this money, spread it to your platform. Here, bitch, take this money, spread it to your platform. So I was just trying to make people understand, yeah, I'm on Instagram raising money, but let me help some of y'all as well. Some people who are activists and organizers, they were having health issues. I shared, they, you know, they go fummies and they made, they bread right. like in a day. So I'm never selfish. Um, I'm very humble. You know, I'm just like the rest of us. Like we right. all in the struggle. And I just want, you know, that whole article was just basically to show people what we go through and what we do every day and how it is important for people to drop that coin. You know, right. to, you know, to just give up that wallet with no questions asked. But if you want to continue to give money to a nonprofit, I say that shit all the time, then go on ahead because going to a person's salary is not going to help. When, you know, that white lady went on a ramp, I donate to the Red Cross and she went all out on me last week. Okay, baby, but you could do that. But at the end of the day, if you donate this money right now that you're doing, if you're saying you're giving up $3,000 a month to, um, you know, the Red Cross, I know three people who need a thousand dollars to pay up their rent. Mm -hmm. It's up Should to we you. know this this black trans uh, this black sex worker in the inbox right now, and she needs the help. So, you know what I'm saying? So like I like I go through it. Like everybody thinks the money is easy, but yeah, I got a team of twelve people. But let me tell you something: the white people who are doing the work, um, they'll tell you I like I go through some shit in my inbox. Half the time they be answering it for me because my, you know, my mouth is so reckless and I'm stressed out because I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating, I'm taking care of my son, and I'm trying to do this online school shit mm -hmm. because the school is closed. Then he got online school, you know, like it's a lot. But I made sure whatever money I raised, I spread it. I'm never for self. Anybody who know me, like in the streets of Newark and East Orange, can tell you I'm never for self. Never. I'm always. If I have a piece of candy right now and you, you you know, and you want a piece, I will give you most of it. Like, that's just how I am. I'm that genuine, but I think right. I need to really um, be careful who I'm so um, genuine with because some people would take your kindness for weakness. So I really got to be careful for that. But I just love Black people. Like, who, like who else going to love us? So I asked T this yesterday, like during conflict, how can you, what is the best way you have found? If black folks are not disposable and you know that you have conflict. And when you start raising money like this, when you start rubbing shoulders with the people you rub shoulders with, somebody is always gonna be like the nigga on the couch and belly, you know, so she black nigga, just angry for no, for no reason because at the end of the day, we all get in what we supposed to get. We all getting into the place we supposed to go, right? So I think about the conflicts that um, have arisen, and to me, it's such small scale to date, to date. What is today's date? 4-15-2020. I have never, never spoke on them issues publicly. I have never dragged anyone because at the end of the day, I will still see you and be, you know, you and I had it out. I, I you know, I told you I was going to bring this up. I still see you and I'd be like, you know what? There's not nothing I don't want for you, though. It, it, I could have a misunderstanding, which is what I think it was, you know, 
I could be like, you know, well, I don't understand why you're moving the way you're moving. It's a little funny to me because these people over here are actively hating on me and you hanging with them, like, you know? And you was like, but I don't talk about, it. like, I could be in community with everybody. And I couldn't understand that to me. It was like loyalty. Where is the loyalty? I don't choose sides. And right. Any you never have. Time, I don't fucking choose sides. There has been, uh, I'm going to be straight up and honest, and I'm sorry if anybody would take this um, anyway. If you see me on Facebook, I have never dragged a black woman. I drag more white people than ever. I will never drag. Money has been stolen from me. I have been talked about. I have raised thousands for different people who have done me wrong, but I never drag them. I never speak up on it. When I see conflict in our community, I don't speak up on it. The only advice I can tell people is stay silent and stay humble. Because when you're quiet, it makes them mad. Because they want to know your every move. People are going to always hate you for every little thing. But that's the one thing I don't like about us is that I hope that this pandemic will bring some of us, not all because some are ignorant, bring some of us um, together. And I'm just happy that you're doing these conversations because we could all learn from one another. I think that this was a perfect time for you to create something so brilliant this way, because now is the time for us more than ever to educate ourselves, to sit down, be humble, and just be quiet. Just be quiet for a minute, because when you're quiet, you might learn something. And that's what I felt to realize to do. I used to cry, mope, and you know, why this person don't love me? I never did nothing. I'm um, stop. Just stay right. humble, quiet, and just learn. And just right. keep it. Yeah, I think, you know, I was have, I'm, I'm excited to bring on, um, there's a trauma counselor coming on next Monday, I believe. And, um, you know, I've been talking to my therapist because I feel like therapy is a luxury, but it's something I'm going to bust my ass to try to afford. I can't afford it. My insurance don't even cover it. And I, and I need it a lot. And I can't afford We got to connect you to a Black therapist. And I don't say that in vain. I think a lot of the problem with Black therapists is when they start offering the shit for free or a discounted, then it's like they're taking on that labor and also not getting compensated. So I don't know. I, I want us to reach out to some people for you because I do feel like you're dealing with a lot. We're all dealing with a lot. And I think about, um, you know, like people who do fundraisers for Black mental health that don't even get questioned. And if they do get questioned, it's not really a threshold they got to answer to because they're not in community with nobody, you know? And that that burns my soul. But I'm going to roll with it. Like, you know what I'm saying? I just, like, you know, I just, I have questions because then I see people like you, I see people like me, and it's a real need. And I make sure that, like, twice a month, I have my $45 sliding scale because I know that if I don't speak with this lady and I don't get my medication, somebody will be getting dragged somebody's going to be crying today. Like, you know, and I just don't want to be 2015 Didi Delgado. I actually want to see my growth. And if my growth means that I have to have like some sort of little accessible aid, like this pill that I pop every night <laughs> before I go to bed, and so be it. Because I have been a much calmer person. And exercising helps too. Like, we're not I know getting you were going anymore. hard at the gym, but I got worried about you because you, you like, had a lot of stress going on and you wasn't feeling good. I have to do it. If I don't exercise and keep my mind off bullshit and negativity, during that time when I start exercising, um, you know, because I got a lot of stress, you know, school, my son, health, money, money is always. And then I'm supposed to be this black fairy godmother person. So it's a lot on me. But during that time, I was being criticized by people who I thought loved me for me and people who I called my sisters. So I dealt with a lot of heartbreak, a lot of friendships were lost during, you know, my birthday. And I said to myself, I said, you know what, fuck this. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to drink my lemon water and I'm going to just start getting right and listen to my Lizzo and keep it moving. And that's what I just started doing. I just started exercising and I just started blacking shit out, you know, right. and I just want you to know that by you doing this and doing other things, you know, I see how you move it. Keep it going because, you know, we, like, we're not getting any younger. We're getting older. We got kids and we got to let them look at us as a, you know, a role model because our generation is not being taught certain things. You know, with our big ass mouths, we, you know, we're able to be stable. We're able to fight back and stuff. Right. But we have to teach our kids how to stick together and 
you know, I think we need to speak. teach our children how to apologize uh, also. At, oh, number one, absolutely. Jarvis is nonverbal and he still apologized. He will do something in style language to show you that he apologized. Right. I'm very happy that I told him that. But, um, you know, that's just me. Like, I'm quiet. Even when there's conflict or my name is in somebody's mouth, you will never see me blurt out or say anything. I will probably put a picture of me going to class or whatever the case may be to show y'all. You're like, unbothered. It bothers me. You can say that you're bothered because I know that some comments, like when the lady said that about your hair, I know that it hurt you. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was fucked up because, you know, I'm like, well, I don't have it, you know, but I'm out here busting my ass to make the world a better place, right. especially for people like us. So, you know, that at that present time, you know, that I, it, you know, that it hurt because, you know, that right. you're honest fucking platform and it's like I have to look like Nia Long or some shit and right. that's not what it is and you're like that's not the reality neither I want to say that you have taught me what grace is because there was a time when I had you blocked because I was like for me the blocking you know we had a conversation about this on my Facebook page like maybe a few months ago for me the blocking is like it's not that I hate you. I don't want to talk to you. It's just, I need this out of my face. Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to run across it on my timeline every day. The sis, the we hugging. I said, I know how this is going to end. And it ended the way I said it was going to end. And I'm sorry for that. But I remember when I, fuck, when I fucked up and I didn't come to you first and say, like, this is what I'm feeling surrounding the situation. When it happened with me and Rhea, and, and I was, I never went up to her and said, this is how I'm feeling about the situation. I was just like, I'm going to, I felt like Nino Brown. Like, you know what I'm saying? I was like, cancel. And then when Tam was like, this is a situation. Who the fuck am I? I'm going I'm to be like, oh, I can't stand her so much because the one time you did something terrible to me, like, you know, or that I perceived it as terrible. And I'm going to be like, you know what? I'm dragging your name for filth. Fuck you. I don't care what you're going through. You're unstable. You're this, you're that. Like, I would never. So when people said that you was, or Rhea was going through something, my nigga, I was in the hospital. And I was like, I understand. We was in the hospital at the same time. I didn't even know I was going through that situation until I was out of the hospital. Right. I, you know, I didn't know. Right. I didn't know. But you never once saw me you know, drag that shit out on Facebook. Right. You never once saw me, it saw me cry wolf. I just said, fuck it. I'm just going to like try to create my own shit, be my own boss. And I kept it moving. I, like and I was- That's why I said, I, like, for me, I learned from you. I appreciate it. And so my apology was public. And I think that that's what a lot of people, that's why I said, I feel like we need to, we need to do it ourselves. Because we, if we say that we trying to create a world in which we want to live in, if I harmed you publicly and people know that I stopped fucking with you publicly, my apology got to be public too. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I think I made a post for you, Rhea, this other nigga, fuck with, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I was like, I'm sorry that I made the, the incorrect assumptions and that I acted out the way that I did. So again, I'm apologizing to you publicly, not for lip service, because clearly you and I have been doing some real solid work together and we've been loving up on each other. But I just want to take the time to publicly apologize to you for making an assumption about the way you move and operating on that assumption. I don't move that way. Anybody who know me, I don't, I know you don't. take sides. It's all about the money to get to these families. At the end of the day, we all fighting, we all gossiping, we all doing, um, going into different spaces and talking about one another and dragging my one another. But these families are hurt and they coming to us saying, yo, I'm about to be evicted at 12 o'clock. They don't want to hear that this person is fighting each other on Facebook. No, like, don't nobody want to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that. So that's my mind. My mind is like, let's get the money. And we're all not going to love each other. We all not going to like each other. That's fine. But we shall all respect each other and keep it, you know, and keep it moving and understand each other's faults. Because a lot of right. things have been done to plenty organizers on this platform, plenty. But a lot of us are not apologizing. A lot of us are not speaking our truths. Um, there were a lot of us. There were two people who did something bad to me, and it still hurts me to this day. But when those two individuals needed groceries, I'm a mother. I refuse to see anybody 
right. um, hungry, hurting, whatever, especially if they are a black woman. So I privately made sure that those two individuals got what they needed. And I guess um, I didn't have them on block. They inboxed me and said, even though I'm beefing with you or did you send this money to me? And I'm like, nah, I ain't send this money. Yes, you did. You sent this money. One person said, you know what, Simone? After everything we've been through, I fucks with you or I'm sorry or something to that right. effect. The other right. individual said, but at, but I still um, choose to choose to distance myself from those right. two individuals. But as a mother, I cannot see a person go hungry. I just right. can't. Especially the kids. So it wasn't about um, you know I could have put it on blast, put it on Facebook. I could have even inboxed too. But at the end of the day, I'm like I'm a and be like, look what this bitch did. <laughs> No, but that's what I'm I feel like me and you in a totally different place in like 2017, 2018. I feel like yeah. that was actually the point of doing this work. It's not just to like collect money and this, that, and the third. If we trying yeah. to help families grow, then what are we doing? That's not my question. Like, what am I doing? I can't come, I can't, I can't ask you what you're doing if I'm not checking in on me. Absolutely. 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 So I just, I, I appreciate that space because I wasn't even sure if we was going to talk about it. So I appreciate it. And I appreciate you accepting my apology because you could have been like, bitch, you did that to me for no reason. And you would have been right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because you didn't do anything wrong to me. I just had this, this thought in my head. I'm like, oh, okay. If she hanging with them and she must be thinking the same thing that they say about me, you know? So I appreciate um, the grace that we were able, you and I were able to fall back into because We've done some pretty amazing things and we're building a relationship I think is important. So thank you, Simone. You're welcome. I'm just trying to build a relationship with all you guys because we're all we have right now. After this pandemic, lives, you know, our, you know, our lives might change. So we don't really have a choice but to stick together. Right. We don't. I was thinking about trying to switch gears for a second. I was thinking about um, you have my friend called me and she was like, Oh, you're interviewing Simone. Did you see that video when she was dancing with her son into Stephanie Mills? And I was like, No, I didn't. I went to go look at it and it was beautiful. Like it was really touching. And I would encourage y'all. I don't know if you shared it publicly, but it was very beautiful. And thank you for sharing those moments. I, you know, thank you. You're welcome. What's the one thing that's the most important to you, Simone? Like where you see yourself in five years after all this? I do see myself as a nurse and I want to um, have two transitional homes because as we know, um, a lot of white people go, well, they can go to shelters, you know, families who face me right. go to shelters. Okay, these shelters are only letting them stay for three weeks. So where the fuck are they supposed to go? It doesn't take a person three weeks to get themselves together. So in five years, I see myself having a transitional home where I'm going to do like a six month program to try to, you know, to try to build some type of stability for these women, try to get them jobs, trying to get them healthy again. Like when the reason why a lot of women, um, they connect with me is because I try my best to give them hope. I just don't throw money at them and keep moving. I try to check in with right. them. Hey, do you need something? Do you need a cigarette? What do you need? And they go, Simone, like, I feel like I'm stuck. Mm. And, and, you know, and in those moments, I feel the same way. So I try to do vision boards or I try to talk to them and try to say, you know, fuck that nigga. You know, I'm on that path too and just work on getting your weight up. So, you know, that's why I see myself just having a transitional home and to just transform a few women and just try to keep it going. Um, I just pray and I want everybody to pray. I just hope my son will be able to talk um, at the age of five. He, he was able to walk and I just see him within five years talking. And being a testimony as well, you know? Well, thank you for sharing that. Like that, I feel like these conversations is helping me break my own heart open because I'd be like, there's no possible way that I could be any more open than I'm open. And then just like listening to you and listen to your story, I'm so appreciative that you even thank sharing your space with me. Thank you for that. I want to talk to you about, you know, you was talking about transitional housing. Number one, um, I want to help you with that Thank because you. I lived in transitional housing when I was a wayward teenager and it helped me get my first apartment actually. And I was one of the very few people I know that was my age living on their own. 
um, and it was going by my income. It was subsidized housing. I lived in Charleston, Massachusetts, and subsidized housing, but I felt very resentful about it because I felt like here I am, no, I didn't have no children at the time, but here I am trying to go to school. I have two jobs, I'm working and they're taking 30% of my income because I live in subsidized housing. Uh, my neighbor, she pays $20 a month for rent. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and her man was a drug dealer. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, come on, equity, something, something gotta work out here. And I wasn't hating, I was just frustrated with the amount of like effort I had to produce. I had to take a bus. Um, from one part of Boston to, to Braintree to go work at my second job. It was like, you know, an hour long ride. But I just want to say that transitional housing, if done right, I think it can help somebody get on their feet and like succeed. And so like, I would love to help you with that at some point if you're interested. I wanted to say like a lot of the things that hold, you know, me and Tam was talking about this when we were watching, um, the Madam C.J. Walker story, a lot of things that hold Black women back, especially, is men, you know, and, like, it's not a man bashing, it's just, like, a lot of men are not where they want to be in life, and then they get with us, and they think that, I don't even know what they want to think, because I actually don't care, you ask my husband, I don't care, do what you gotta do, like, you know, and so I wanted to ask you, you know, I know you're not in a relationship right now, right, what would a relationship look like for you? Like the ideal relationship, like like if you already working on the relationship with yourself, what does a relationship with someone who's loving look like for you? I want the person to love me 100%, not 50%. A lot of women who are married or have boyfriends, a lot of the women, um, excuse me, a lot of the men are in love with them 50% and not 100%. And I think that's what comes with the failing marriages, the failing relationships, the cheating, the lies. Um, I was with my son's father for 10 and a half years. That's but a long I let him time to be with somebody. 10 years. Um, I had to let him go because he only loved me for 50%. As soon as I let him go, so many things have happened for me. You know, um, I was able to like enroll into school. You know, my family was cheering me on. Like, you know what? Just let him go, go to school. Um, I was able to get Jarvis, you know, the services that he needed. Um, just so many doors just start opening for right. me. I felt like dead weight and I started loving myself. I felt as though because I was a heavy sized girl. Well, he made me, excuse me, he made me feel like because I was a heavy sized girl, uh, excuse me, a heavy girl and we had a child with autism that he was the only one that was going to be there for me. He was the only one who was going to have sex with me. Um... And that there was nobody else in this world, verbally and physically abusive. Um, I was out here trying to force myself to get Pampers wipes and everything um, for Jarvis. And he's out in Brownsville chilling with his boys, you know, driving in cars. So, you know, um, I'm not even focused on trying to get a relationship. I'm just trying to love on myself and get myself have, um, um, healthy. And of course, there's a lot of guys who I talk to. I'm right. just not engaging in that situation right now. Right. Thank you so much for sharing. I think a lot of people, like I'm not crying, um, but a lot of people would identify with that as like the feeling like being with someone because you yourself want to be with somebody. I mean, I can only speak for myself, but you yourself want that companionship and that them treating you as if they're settling for you or like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and so to hear you say it kind of validates a lot of feelings for me. And I appreciate you giving the advice that you have to be with someone who loves you 100% and not 50%. Because a lot of these people, men, women, gender non-conforming folks, sometimes just want to be with a person just to make sure they have for the rent get paid or just to make sure like they got a warm body to lay to, next to it at night, you know? And I really look forward to the relationships i i put a lot of people on my on my block list i took a lot of people off my block list but i put a lot of people that i was romantically involved with on my block list i mean you got a wow. nigga that hit me up on marco polo the other day bitch you know how long it's been since i used marco polo like two years i used it for one month two years ago you use that though no and so that's what happened i guess 
he was bored during this pandemic. This nigga sent me a fucking minute and a half long message talking about, well, I never want something to happen to you. And I never get the opportunity to tell you how much I think about you and how much I wish things was different. And if you wish things was different, then like do things differently. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know, and I'm not falling for that. Like I'm in a good place right now with myself. I'm trying to make, you know, I had always thought someone that I was going to have a network, a, like this channel where I could have different kinds of people, like a Netflix, like in different programs would pop up. And, and you know, for, for so long, I tried to do this, but I was focusing on everybody else's child except for mine, like, you know, so I appreciate this conversation because I feel like you brought up some things for me that I'm not willing to acknowledge and that I will be sitting with, you know, okay. I learned from you so much all the time. I learn from all of you guys every day. You know, sometimes when I'm in the bathroom and I have that long time, because that's all the time I have, yes. you know, my long time, I go ahead and I just read you guys' posts and I just learn a lot from everybody. We all learn from each other, but, you know. Thank you so much for appearing on the show, for agreeing, for coming and saying, yes, i will do what you want me to talk about. And I like the show format that I've done so far. Because I know people plan out their podcast and I just be like, tell me what you want to talk about. And I'm going to tell you what I want to talk about. And we just going to talk about it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's like you and I are the guests curating the show together. So I appreciate you coming. Please continue. This is very healthy. And um, I got some healing out because I don't always tell people my business. I'm a very private person. But um, I can't always be Black Fairy Godmother. I have to be myself. And today I was able to be myself with you and to everybody else. And I just want to thank y'all. And, you know, um, thank God Jarvis was asleep. I was able to do this <laughs> or else we would have been in trouble. Night, night time. <laughs> well, absolutely. Before I forget, because I cannot let you go. Do you have any upcoming projects you want to share with us about? Come on, yes. a bitch with a ponytail always got a project. Come on. <laughs> Listen, okay, so I have a project. I'm not going to announce the three um, Black organizing activists that I'm working with, but it is a project called Love on Them. And Love on Them project, um, I'm going to start doing podcasts in July, and we're going to talk about some of the issues that are affecting our Black communities, and I'm going to have people come on. And when I have people come on, I want them to nominate one black activist or one black organizer who is currently struggling. Um, you know, they're making dreams come true. They're doing so many things on ground, but we need to make their dream come true. So I'm right. um, starting in July. I'm going to have a fund where I'm going to raise $2,000 and that love on them individual will get the $2,000. They can start a business. They can um, invest in themselves. Hell, they could buy a whole bunch of bitches if they want to. Whatever they want to do is just to help them rebuild themselves instead of worrying about everybody else. I'm really excited and looking forward to that project. And I don't, I don't mind supporting you in whatever your endeavors are. You need me to share something, I'll share it. You know, um, <laughs> thank you so much for appearing. And, and I'm gonna, I put your Cash App, your PayPal, and your Venmo up in the description. So when you get a chance, just share it to your page or whatever. And like, we're going to make sure that people take care of you during this pandemic. So, okay. And thank you so much, guys. And I love you guys. And just try to get some sleep. All right, Simone. Thank you so much for appearing on the full set. I appreciate you. I love you. And I hope you have a great night, boo. Love you and love you all. Good night. All right, peace.